The Lincoln Academy of Illinois is proud to be an official member of the Illinois Bicentennial Commission. Support for this program comes from the Lincoln Academy of Illinois 2018 Friends. Information available at thelincolnacademyofillinois.org slash 2018-friends. From the historic Coronado Theater in Rockford, Illinois, the Lincoln Academy of Illinois presents its 54th annual Convocation and Investiture of Laureates. Since 1965, the nonpartisan, not-for-profit Lincoln Academy of Illinois has honored more than 300 people who have brought honor to their state in the spirit of Abraham Lincoln. Each spring, the laureates of the Lincoln Academy are presented by the governor with the state's highest award for individual achievement, the Order of Lincoln Medallion. The Lincoln Academy also recognizes leaders of the future by honoring outstanding senior students at each of the state's four-year degree-granting institutions of higher learning in ceremonies held each fall at the Old State Capitol in Springfield. Tonight we add the names of eight remarkable people to our distinguished roster of Lincoln laureates. We gather tonight to recognize uncommon achievement by illuminating the stories of leadership and generosity that have defined our honorees and their contributions. Their pioneering work and selfless civic engagement have profoundly shaped the vibrancy of the cultural, technological, scientific, and economic fabric of our state, our nation, and our world. Mozart was around five and a half, six, when he composed and performed his first work. In Emily Bear's case, Emily beat him by over a year. And from the tender age of six, seven, eight, nine, she's appeared in all the major houses of America, many in Europe. She discovered jazz, a great love of mine, has her own jazz trio, Mozart never had that. And she's such a charming and graceful and caring and generous young woman. She is going to be, she is arguably the most talented laureate ever, and certainly she will be the youngest laureate in the history of the Academy and for all time that I can foresee. Boy, are we proud of her here in Rockford. It is uh, truly my personal honor that tonight we present the Order of Lincoln to Miss Emily Bear. I honestly can't really remember a time where music wasn't a part of my life. Um, we always had a piano in the house, so it's, it's just always been there. It's not like someone just plopped me in front of a piano and was like, play. <laughs> it's just, I kind of, I guess, naturally gravitated towards it. It could well be said that Emily Bear's first language was music. At 18 months, she began playing the piano and started composing music at age three. She was a published composer by age four. As a five-year-old, she discovered jazz and made her professional solo debut at the Ravinia Music Festival. When she was six, she performed at the White House and made her national television debut on The Ellen DeGeneres Show. Even though I'm labeled a prodigy, I mean, I'm just a normal person. I'm, I went to high school, I go to summer camp, uh, I have friends, stuff. <laughs> Prom. You do all the stuff that every all the other kids do. <laughs> yeah. A chart-topping recording artist, Emily enjoys arranging, orchestrating, and performing in a diverse collection of styles, including pop, film scoring, jazz, and classical. I don't usually write it by hand when I'm writing music. I mean, I can, of course, but it's not my preferred way. Uh, usually, if I'm it honestly depends on what kind of piece I'm writing. Like if I'm songwriting, I'll do a completely different process than if I was, you know, scoring a film or writing a jazz tune. Um, 
but usually I'm inspired by something. It can be a place or a person or an experience or an experience one of, you know, someone really close to me had. Um, and I just start from there. When I first started classical music, uh, I liked to do everything that wasn't on the page. <laughs> and so I discovered jazz a few months after I started classical lessons. And for me, that was amazing because I found something where I could be, you know, freer and um, I could take some of my own creativeness and, you know, improvise, which I mean, I've done when I've written music, but to actually do it like that was so fun for me. Um, and it is, they're, they're very different, but now learning like all this theory and stuff, it's amazing how much of it is so similar. She's performed on many of the world's most famous stages, including Carnegie Hall, Lincoln Center, and the Hollywood Bowl. Emily has helped raise millions for charities through performances and events across the world, and donates a portion of the sales of her CDs and songbooks. She's recorded seven albums and composed hundreds of original musical pieces. Her mentor, Grammy-winning musician and producer Quincy Jones, calls her the complete 360-degree package, and there are no limits to the musical heights she can reach. So when I first met him, it was kind of like the ages just fell away, and he just has so much wisdom, not only about you know music, but also about life. And... Um, over the years, he's one of my closest mentors and influences. After high school, Emily plans to study at the prestigious Berklee College of Music in Boston. She's currently working on a new album, featuring her singing her original compositions. I'm super anxious to release some of my voice because, you know, it's totally different than playing the piano. Um, it's a whole different way of communicating. And the more I do it, the more I really fall in love with it. I can't tell you how much it means to receive this award, not only in Rockford, but on this stage where I've practically grown up. And Abraham Lincoln was right on when he said this. I like to see a man proud of the place in which he lives, and I like to see a man live so that his place will be proud. I hope to always make Rockford proud. Thank you. <laughs> Tonight, I am surrounded by incredible people who have accomplished so many life-changing and significant feats. And I have personally been inspired by each and every one of my laureates, fellow laureates. <laughs> and so tonight, I accept this award as a testament to what I've accomplished in the past 16 years, but most importantly, for the future yet to come. I thank you all, Governor, Chancellor, and the members of the Lincoln Academy, and I hope to continue working my way toward a lifetime of achievement. Thank you. Dick Butkus spent uh, nine years, his entire professional football career, with the Bears, as you know, regarded as one of the best linebackers of all time. He was elected to the Pro Football Hall of Fame in 1979, his first year of eligibility. He was elected to the College Football Hall of Fame in 1983. He played three seasons as a center and linebacker at my alma mater, the University of Illinois, before being selected in the 1965 NFL Draft. A two-time All-American, Butkus helped Illinois uh, to victory in the Rose Bowl in 1964. Since retiring from football, Butkus has pursued acting and broadcasting as well as being a well-known celebrity endorser. Butkus supports a variety of charitable causes via the Butkus Foundation. One of these causes addresses high school athlete steroid use. Sadly, Dick is unable to be with us tonight, but he is represented by his son, Matt. Matt lives in Chicago and notes that he also played on a Rose Bowl champion team 
but it was at USC. To receive the Order of Lincoln on behalf of his father, Dick Butkus, Matthew Matt Butkus. I love the way Dick played football. As a football player myself, uh, I really loved watching films of him play, watching the way that he just truly threw his body and, and played with reckless abandon. He, he loved the game, he loved the spirit of it, he loved the competitiveness, he loved the physicality. People were, you know, not scared, but they would, they could, you know, forget about holding the ball, and that was the biggest thing he was all about it hit hard and strip and strip the ball. It wasn't just to hit hard, it was to knock the ball out and to cause a turnover. And Dick Butkus credits the Fighting Illini's great conditioning program and high expectations for his team's success in the early 60s. When we came for, for practice that summer, each coach had like a conditioning drill. And of course, Bill Taylor been in the Marines, he had his doing all this marine stuff. You know, we had some ability, but really I think what we did, we just out-conditioned and out-hit everybody because we worked so damn hard. If we can play longer and harder than anybody, we got a chance with this group, and, and that's what basically happened. I think we just out-conditioned everybody. Butkus recalls the tactics that led the Fighting Illini to victory over the much faster Washington Huskies of the Pac-10 during the 1964 Rose Bowl. Pete told me, he said, listen, if we are going to uh, kick off, I want you to first, very first play, get a call and, and just yell it out and have everybody take a hit at the guy across from them. I says, yeah, that's, that'll be great. You know? So we go out there. They were so fast that by the time I was called it out, we were like perfect timing with the snap and we got a sack. You know, I mean, it was like... Uh, Unbelievable timing is what it was because I, I didn't realize they're you know they were really fast coming up in the line and everything, and so that was it. That set the tone. Butkus was an instant star for the Chicago Bears, recognized for his instinct, strength, leadership, aggression, and overall toughness. He certainly is the gold standard. He's he's the one against which all others are being measured, and uh, it speaks to quality. It speaks to passion. It speaks to intensity. Uh, there perhaps isn't another position in football that quite embodies what football is, more so than middle linebacker. And to, to know the way that he played it and, and to continue to really define the position all these decades after his career was over just speaks to the, the quality of the player he was and in, in the way that he chose to play the game. A popular broadcaster and actor following his football career, Dick Butkus is now focused on giving back through the Butkus Foundation, trying to keep young athletes off of steroids. We had the, the linebacker award and, and, uh, for college, and so we instituted one for pros and for high schools. And uh, what we do is we make sure they sign a letter saying that they're playing clean and uh, we let's see what's going on our ninth year for high school and ninth year for the pros that along with the foundation is a thing called takes heart where uh, I have a cardiovascular wellness center in Orange County California and we want people and uh, I want to establish maybe 32 of those sites in all uh, in each and every NFL city where uh, regular people can come and get a scan of their heart because heart disease is the leading killer of men and women. I think I know my dad pretty well. So I can safely say that if he were standing in this place at this moment as the honorary, honorary of this august body, he would be shaking at the knees. So please have some appreciation for how I feel right now. <laughs> But I know and want you to know that Dick Butkus will treasure this award at least as passionately as he does his membership in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. My dad does not consider himself a hero. He's just doing what he should do. No more, no less, quietly and privately. Head down, determined to spread the word. All any of us need is always within us. It's in our hearts. Play clean, play hard, play fair, and always tell the truth to others and to yourself. That's my dad, 
That's 51. Thank you. You're going to no doubt want to know more about all these wonderful people when you leave uh, this evening, and I just bet some of you will turn to YouTube, and that's why we're honoring Stephen Chin tonight. He is the co-founder and former chief technology officer of YouTube, and he's credited with building YouTube into a viral video phenomenon and helping to lead it through a $1.65 billion acquisition by Google. After the acquisition of YouTube, Stephen engaged in several internet initiatives and for the past four years has been an entrepreneur in residence for Google Ventures, investing in technology startups that improve lives and change industry. An alumnus of the Illinois Mathematics and Science Academy and the University of Illinois in Champaign, Stephen was born in Taiwan and his family immigrated to the United States when he was eight years old. Through a lead gift of a million dollars, the Illinois Mathematics and Science Academy opened the Steve and Jamie Chin Center of Innovation and Inquiry two years ago. To receive the Order of Lincoln on behalf of Stephen Chi Chin is Stephanie Pace Marshall, Chancellor of the Lincoln Academy. Steve is very sorry that he is not able to be with us and very grateful that he is, uh, has the opportunity to share some thoughts. And I spoke with him and said, I need to share your thoughts. I, not, I don't want to share thoughts that I think you might say. So I am going to share with you what Steve wrote for this evening. I first want to thank the Lincoln Academy for this humbling honor. To be connected to the name and legacy of Abraham Lincoln is a very, very high bar. And I pledge to strive to live up to his character and integrity. I believe there are two variables that separate success and failure, luck and perseverance. So I'll begin with luck and a few stories. While in elementary school, my parents bought an Apple II computer that was how I learned to type on the QWERTY keyboard, how I learned what a programming language was, and how I learned to create something useful from a huge investment of time and a lot of typing. Access to a computer at the dawn of the personal computing age was luck, and I spent most weekends with my computer and my ideas. When I was a freshman in high school, I heard about the Illinois Math and Science Academy I didn't know much about it, but the idea of being immersed in an innovative and dynamic learning environment where all the students had a passion for math and science was incredibly exciting. Computer science at the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana was the next chapter, and here the entire spectrum of computing opportunities opened, and I was surrounded by those who had similar passions in programming. Then when PayPal started, I was asked to join the team. Now that was very lucky. Now iconic names, Max Levchin, Elon Musk, Peter Thiel. We grew, took PayPal public, and survived the dot-com crash of 2000. Again, I was lucky. And then I met the guy who would become my partner in creating YouTube, Chad Hurley. We collaborated on several PayPal projects while at the same time meeting almost every day in a small coffee shop in Palo Alto to talk about what we wanted to do next. We finally arrived at the idea of streaming videos, which at the time was practically non-existent and stamped with impracticality. YouTube grew faster than any company at the time. So we needed experienced staff, but we didn't have funding. So I paid everything off on my personal credit card, burning my savings. We needed to scale, and we were running out of capital. So we reached out to a well-known venture capital firm, and our first round of funding enabled us to continue. During this time, everyone worked around the clock any hour of the day or night, weekdays, weekends, meetings at 2 a.m. on Saturday night, staff rotations of 30 hours, 20 hours of work, and 10 hours of sleep. We faced countless challenges, legal, copyright, scalability, but through an incredible team and a credit card, we emerged. 
I understand that luck is only part of the story. It may get us to the door, but we choose whether to walk through it or not. And that requires commitment and persistence. There are plenty of really great ideas that never take off before, because the first courageous step of taking a chance to the unknown was never taken. The parade of successful innovators and entrepreneurs will continue. The details of their stories will be different. But I believe the common thread will be perseverance. I encourage all young people here tonight that if you see a solution to a problem, take that first step. Swing that bat enough times, and you will hit a home run. And when you do, it will not be because of luck, but because you stayed in the game and you didn't give up. To be truly successful, we must remember where we came from, and we must give back and help lift up others so that they too can become lucky. Thank you for this honor. Reverend Michael Garanzini, a priest of the Society of Jesus, has dedicated his, his work to higher education. He was professor at Georgetown University, and then was selected to be the 23rd president of Loyola University. He transformed Loyola University with his business skill, financial management, and fundraising efforts. Enrollments rose, health science education thrived. He also played a very important role in the establishment of Arupe College, which is a two-year program, a work-study program, where graduates leave without debt. In 2011, Father Garanzini was appointed as Secretary for Higher Education for the Society of Jesus, addressing global higher education issues. He continues in this role and currently is a visiting research faculty member at Fordham University. To receive the Order of Lincoln from Chicago and New York, Reverend Michael J. Garanzini. Since its founding in 1870 as St. Ignatius College, Loyola University has grown up alongside the city of Chicago. Growing up with the city meant working with the new communities that were here. It meant working with the Jewish community and the Italian community and the Germans and the Irish especially and, and helping them fit in. It was hard for these immigrant groups to find their way into the profession. So it became very important that Loyola became a, a collection of professional schools. So it's medical school, nursing school, law school, business school. Those were the schools that helped Loyola grow with the city and help the city grow. So um, we are intimately bound up with the city and with uh, the politics of the region, uh, the politics of the whole state, uh, and, and very proud of that. We're very proud that we've made a contribution. Father Michael Garanzini studied family psychology at St. Louis University in his hometown, a background that has served him well in his decades as an academic administrator. Learning how to fight fair, learning how to stay engaged, not withdrawing, and so on. Those are all the things you do as a family therapist. You have to keep people together so that they can work out their differences because they, they want to flee the tension and the, and the, and the problem. Well, that's not a bad preparation I found out for university administration because that's the whole deal here is how do we, we have great minds. Everybody's got a wonderful opinion, <laughs> by the way. Everybody thinks they're right, of course. Um, and you've got very different constituencies with very different views on how things should happen and what's the next best thing to do. And we have to keep, we have to stay at the table. We have to fight. We have to avoid the bickering uh, outside of the meeting. You know, let's do it all right here together. So I found uh, that that little um, training in family therapy actually is, uh, it, it, it helped me a long way in doing university administration. During Garanzini's 14 years as president and two years as chancellor, Loyola's campuses were transformed and expanded. Enrollments increased with renewed emphasis on health science, education, and research. I think Loyola, um, when I got here, was really uh, 
searching for and need of um, somebody to hold things together uh, and to, 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 to offer a vision. That's, that's really all I did. Uh, and the vision could not have been um, realized with, without certain ingredients, the most important of which are the people who came to the rescue to help people like me get this accomplished. This building is in disrepair. We need a new, uh, we need a new science center. We need a new uh, research center at the hospital. Whatever it was, getting people to come together, relying on our friends and our alums, offering this vision of what we could be, they did the work. Um, and, and I've been, again, lucky. Father Garanzini believes the undergraduate experience is key to Loyola's success. Making the undergraduate experience a rich one requires great faculty, dedicated faculty. It requires also the kind of amenities that will create an environment that the kids are going to feel they're going to be attracted to, they're going to enjoy. So I think concentrating there on the undergraduate experience was, was critical for our restoring our, uh, our past and restoring and, and gaining our successes. As the Jesuit Secretary for Higher Education, Father Garanzini is now focused on starting a research and development center for global education. For looking at how we Americans and how those around the world, how we could collaborate on things. You know, whether it's education about the environment, education about social justice and economic reform, education about interreligious collaboration. Those are those are topics that we've got to prepare this next generation with. And it's true in India, it's true in France, it's true, it's the same in Bogota as it is here in Chicago at Loyola. Today's assault on truth in the public arena within um, a toxic political environment, the hyper politicization of media and the weakening of our intolerance of dishonesty and the use of political office for personal gain. These are dangerous developments that threaten the principles of honesty, respect for the law, and our duty to promote the common good over personal or, pro or tribal gain. The very principles that the Lincoln Academy stands for. I just want to say in closing, our universities are the envy of the world. Our universities produce a disproportionate share of the world's scientists, inventors, artists, and civic leaders. And our universities are the surest way to uphold our democratic values. An education, an educated citizenry is needed now to protect our democratic experiment, which is now in greater need of shoring up than any time since our great President Lincoln held office. Thank you very much. Melody Hobson is President of Aerial Investments, one of the largest African-American owned money management and mutual fund companies in the United States. Ms. Hobson handles firm-wide management and strategic planning with oversight of all operations outside of research and portfolio management. A nationally recognized expert on financial literacy and investor education, Melody is a regular contributor and analyst for CBS News. She co-founded Aerial Community Academy, a public school in Chicago's South Side, she chairs the Economic Clubs of Chicago's Board of Directors and After School Matters, a nonprofit that provides Chicago teens with high quality out of school program. Time Magazine named Melody Hobson as one of the 100 most influential people in the world. To receive the Order of Lincoln from Chicago, Illinois, Melody Hobson. First, I believe you start with a 401k. Melody Hobson is breaking stereotypes as an investment management expert, philanthropist, and social servant. 
she credits her late mother with giving her the confidence to believe that she could do anything in life. She was very uh, much of the, the, the perspective that the possibilities for any person were endless. Um, at the same time, she used to tell me, and I joke that I'll probably write this on my tombstone one day, she used to say, be the labor, great or small, do it well or not at all. Hobson's path to success in the world of finance began early. I had the good fortune to go to Princeton, and the founder of Ariel and our CEO, John Rogers, did as well. He's 11 years older, and he used to do um, work with the Princeton Schools Committee, which would, would interview students for the university. And in that process, he led the schools committee in Chicago. He became aware of me, I got accepted, and then I found out that Ariel took summer interns. And over the course of getting to know him over the years, I asked if I could be an intern in my, the sophomore year of, um, at Princeton, I became an intern at Ariel. And that's really when I discovered the world of money and investing. And then the next year I went and became an intern at T. Rowe Price, a big money management firm. And then I came back to Ariel after I graduated from college. She rose quickly at Ariel, becoming the firm's president in 2000. We talk about being patient investors. So we manage money for people, stock portfolios. We do them for big institutional clients like universities and corporations and public funds. But we also do them for individual investors. Anyone with $1,000 can invest with us. In that, in that regard, we invest their kids' college education money. We invest their IRAs, regular accounts that they may have that they're saving for anything. Um, every day we're trying to eke out some gains in the stock market to enrich our clients so that they can have better lives. As a network analyst, Hobson is nationally recognized for her expertise in finance, markets, and economic trends. Austin in Springfield asks, Melody, I've reached the point where I'm thinking about talking to a financial advisor. Money is a very intimidating concept for many people. There's data that shows that a parent of a young child would rather talk to them about sex or drugs versus money. And that really does stun me, that money falls behind those two subjects. And so any way that I can help demystify money in a way that will make people uh, learn more and ultimately become more financially secure, I think is a great thing for our society. A champion of diversity in the workplace, Hobson believes we as a society can no longer afford to be colorblind. We must be color brave instead. I really came to this point of view when lots of people would always tell me, I don't see race. I don't see it at all. And I say, I find that very fascinating because everyone around you is the same color that you are. So something's not working in that perspective or that theory. And so as a result of that, I really said, I would love people to see it. I think if they would see it, they'd see when it's missing. I think they would see when they haven't been inclusive. I think that they would see how they can benefit from it. And I think that if we're willing to talk about subject matters that are t at times uncomfortable, it ultimately leads again to a better, more tolerant society. The Chicago native is also a strong believer in giving back to her community. Ariel is of our community in lots of ways, from having started the Ariel Community Academy, which is a small public school that um, was started, um, to the many boards and organizations that we all belong to, where we are trying to make Chicago great. We know we love this city and think it's great, and that we want to be a part of the success story of Chicago, not just as a business, but as a community where people want to live and work. And ultimately, that affects people wanting to come and work and live here. I've always felt I had the good fortune to be born in the middle of the country. And I felt that way because there's a great truth about our state, which is that we have tremendous values and we have a tremendous work ethic. And when I think about why I'm standing here, I think it's those two things, work ethic and values. And I, of course, think about my late mother, who instilled those two important things in me. When I was growing up, she always used to see them, say to me, and I tell this story all the time, she would say, Melody, you can be or do anything. And I believed her, even though I couldn't imagine what that would all come to be. And I've exceeded every expectation that I had for my life. But she also said something equally important. She said, don't ever have to. And she used to say over and over and over again to me, be the labor, great or small, do it well or not at all. 
be the labor great or small, do it well or not at all. So it was work ethics and values that I think is the reason that I'm standing here. I could not be more grateful for this special honor. And I want all of you to know, and all of the other laureates, as well as the members of the Academy to know, that I will work hard to continue to earn it every single day. Thank you so much. A farm boy from McDonough County in Illinois, Ed McMillan earned his bachelor's degree in agricultural science from the University of Illinois. And he began shortly after that his career with Ralston Perina as a field representative. He advanced to eventually serve as chief executive officer and president of Purina Mills. With nearly a half century of agricultural business experience, McMillan is recognized today as one of the top consultants and chief executive officers in the industry. He specializes in mergers, acquisitions, divestures, and creating business alliances. In 2009, Pat uh, Governor Pat Quinn appointed McMillan to the University of Illinois Board of Trustees. In 2015, our Governor Bruce Rauner reappointed McMillan and he then chaired the board for the following two years. Ed McMillan exemplifies a life of service to others, his profession and his community. To receive the Order of Lincoln from Greenville, Illinois, Edward L. McMillan. Ed McMillan always figured he'd become a farmer after graduating from the University of Illinois, but it wasn't meant to be. At that point in time, in the mid-60s, agriculture was a tough economic situation. And my dad said, hey, there's no place for you to come home and farm to, because he was a tenant farmer, didn't own any land. And so that's when I began to think, oh my gosh, I gotta figure out something else to do. And so I decided I'd major in farm management. McMillan changed career paths after a college internship with Ralston Purina. And then fortunately, Ralston came back in the spring of 69, offered me a full-time job. And so that whole sequence uh, moved me from going home to being a farmer, to being a farm manager, to actually going into the business world, and I guess you could say I never looked back from that point on. McMillan rose through the ranks to become CEO and president of Purina Mills, the nation's leader in animal nutrition products. You know, if there was a benchmark to my career in Ralston Purina over 28 years, it's number one, having great mentors, number two, uh, trying to live up to what I said I would do, and number three, People having confidence in me to give me challenges and opportunities um, that I had a chance to succeed at. McMillan's leadership role at Purina gave him the experience he needed to become one of the country's top agribusiness consultants. Every company has several alternatives. Number one is to grow organically within the current market. Number two is to step out into a whole new arena and take risk. Number three is maybe acquire something that allows you to expand. The other is maybe a merger with someone else that can help you go forward or shut it down. And I've been on over 15 boards in the last 20 some years <clears throat> and we've done all of that from growing organically to shutting it down. And I think the fact that I've been through the various experiences at Purina gave me the opportunity to be able to counsel people and ultimately make that decision. McMillan's service on the University of Illinois Board of Trustees is an opportunity to give back to an institution that gave him so much. It is a remarkable place. Uh, we have three campuses, six medical schools, soon to have seven, uh, 83,000 students and over 20,000 employees and $5.6 billion budget. But it's in the business of changing the lives of young people just as it changed mine and creating opportunities wherever they may decide they're going to go in a career. Uh, it's made a big difference to a lot of people and its challenge now is to adapt to where higher education is going in the future. And how does it continue to give opportunities for young kids growing up on the farm, kids growing up in the inner city, kids from other nations around the world uh, to get the education, 
to provide the opportunity for them to pursue a career. Uh, there isn't anything else other than my faith in God and my family that is important in my life than the University of Illinois. I think he served as an incredible role model of what it means to be an active, engaged, forward-thinking alum. When he, he graduated, it wasn't the end of his Illinois experience. It was the beginning of a new journey with the University of Illinois. And I think he has actually demonstrated to people what it's truly like to embody the essence of being an Illini. I would characterize him as a servant leader. He leads with a sort of grounded philosophical placement in the honor and goodness and integrity of the institution that carries forward into everything he does. He cares about our students, he listens to the students, he reads everything that we, uh, we could uh, throw at him, and uh, he thinks with discernment, he never displaces the important with the urgent, which is important when you're thinking about the evolution of an institution like ours. So those characteristics are, are incredibly valuable uh, for the University of Illinois, and, and we're so thankful that Ed uh, delivers on that every day. I really feel that I'm a product of Abraham Lincoln. Because of the Morale Act, because of land-grant schools, we were able to go on to the University of Illinois and get a degree in, in agriculture. And that created a career opportunity. For me, in particular, giving back as a, as a part of the University of Illinois has been a critical part of my life. From chairing the Alumni Association, the, the uh, Board of Trustees, the Research Park Board in Champaign, and also our Illinois Ventures Board, has been a blessing for me to have an opportunity to participate in creating opportunities for more young people, whether it's from rural areas or from urban areas, to find a career, to find a future, and again, Abraham Lincoln created that opportunity for me and millions of other young people. So again, thanks to the Academy, I'm so blessed and so humbled to have this opportunity and, and to be a part of this group that's here. Thank you very much. Dr. Lewis Philipson has been engaged in research and care of patients living with diabetes for more than 30 years. Throughout his career, his work is focused on the genetics of diabetes and the biophysical, molecular, and genetic aspects of insulin secretion. A globally respected endocrinologist, Dr. Philipson is James C. Tyree Professor of Diabetes Research and Care in the Departments of Medicine and Pediatrics and Director of the Kovler Center, uh, Diabetes Center at the University of Chicago. His interdisciplinary team is recognized as the leading group in the United States for expertise in the treatment of diabetes caused by gene mutations that are especially difficult to manage. As a principal investigator, Dr. Philipson has conducted numerous research projects funded by the National Institute of Health, the American Diabetes Association, and the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation to receive the Order of Lincoln from Chicago, Illinois, Dr. Lewis Philipson. This is a three-dimensional molecule of insulin, so the individual amino acids are shown. Dr. Lewis Philipson's love of science began with ham radio as a youngster growing up on Long Island, New York. I got interested in science and math early on. Uh, you know, I was one of those kids in the chess club and um, interested in, in, in early on in physics and, and science. And gradually, uh, from my interest in radio, got interested in other kinds of science. And then uh, more and more focused on biology. Globally respected as an endocrinologist, Dr. Philipson is a leading authority on diabetes mellitus. People are mostly aware of two major types of diabetes, type 1, which is really the absence of insulin for the most part, and type 2 diabetes, which is, for the most part, resistance to insulin. But between those two things, there's now a fair amount of overlap. So, so the, the basic idea, though, is that we need to either make the body more sensitive to the insulin that's produced, or we need to somehow increase the insulin that's made. With the first 10 or 15 years, I was really focused on 
what are the factors that control insulin secretion much like neurons or the heart cells. And so at the end of the day, that amounts to electricity. Some years later, a discovery was made that children can have diabetes in the first few months of life that is caused in some cases by a specific abnormality in the proteins that control ions passing through the cell. So it was exactly an interface between my interest in diabetes and my work in insulin secretion. His research team focused on a rare form of type 1 diabetes caused by genetic abnormalities. Entirely by chance, Dr. Phillipson met with the parents of a young girl named Lily who was born with this form of diabetes. This particular mutation is sensitive to pills and the cheapest, most common pills we use for type 2 diabetes. So it's a kind of, it is a a remarkable intersection of ideas and happenstance. And then once Lily went on these pills, she hasn't had to take insulin since. These are our mailers that contain the information to participate in one of our research studies. Philipson's team is now tracking thousands of patients and their families through a national registry. This registry now includes well over 3,000 individuals and almost 1,000 have a genetic diagnosis. Now, Lily's is rare still, so the kinds that are just like Lily, probably about 100. But considering that before I met Lily 12 years ago, I had never even heard of this particular kind of diabetes, that's a fairly remarkable situation. And of the other 900 with known mutations, a large percentage of them have also come off insulin or have had their therapies changed for slightly different reasons, but the main, the overall connection is that they have mutations in single genes that cause diabetes. As president-elect of the American Diabetes Association, Dr. Philipson is proud of the work that's been done and passionate about the work that remains. The promised land is getting people off insulin to have a cure for diabetes. And while, you know, we're maybe only helping one or two percent of that 28 million, uh, it does give us a taste of what life could be without this terrible thing. This honor really goes to those who've inspired me on my journey, first and foremost, my patients. Some of my colleagues have compared the often invisible suffering of diabetes to the situation of Ginger Rogers. We remember her partner, the great dancer Fred Astaire, yet Rogers did everything he did backwards and in high heels. <laughs> People with diabetes have to think about their blood sugar and insulin needs all the time in order to survive. One study suggests that they are making 300 more decisions every day than folks without diabetes, and they survive. They persevere with grace and dignity, often without anyone realizing how much more work they have to do every day than those without diabetes. They are inspiring. My teachers have also guided and inspired me. They have overcome challenges and persisted in efforts to care for their patients while steadfastly pursuing discoveries, both large and small, that have contributed to the prevention and treatment of diabetes and related conditions. With them, I include my students, who are my greatest teachers. I am grateful for the 40 years I've spent as a student, physician, and faculty member in one of the greatest cities in the world, Chicago, and the state of Illinois, whose values, culture, and politics shape one of the greatest leaders in the history of our country, a person of eloquence, honesty, honor, and compassion, Abraham Lincoln. Thank you for this recognition. I am pro profoundly honored to be a laureate of the Order of Lincoln. Dave Rydell, who took a small manufacturing company of some 15 to 20 people hiring out after going to Augustana College over in the Quad Cities, has turned it into an international juggernaut, Bergstrom, and along the way has demonstrated such good, not only here in Rockford, but throughout Northern Illinois, and in fact internationally, because he made sure Bergstrom uh, became a sizable and important international company. Dave Rydell is a treasure, and I know we neighbors who know him uh, know so much about what he has done and continues to do for thousands, literally thousands, 
of individuals and countless institutions on whose boards he served. And it's my great privilege and honor to announce that the Order of Lincoln will be given to, from Rockford, Mr. Dave Rydell. This is one of our No Idol products. Dave Rydell is right at home on the assembly line at the Bergstrom Incorporated plant in Rockford, Illinois. He's been working at the company since high school. And I started sweeping floors on Saturday mornings and uh, uh, then I would work in like sub-assembly or something like that uh, in the summers and when I was out of school. So yeah, I, I've spent all my whole working life here at Bergstrom, but that's how it got started. Rydell's father was part of the Bergstrom company when it started manufacturing heaters for school buses and other large vehicles. Um, my dad had, had um, a broad breadth of experience and knowledge in a lot of areas and uh, through Mr. Bergstrom out selling, uh, they continue to grow the company and, and the markets. And uh, then through the years and the decades as products became more sophisticated, for instance, we moved from heating into combination heating air conditioning units. Um, the company continued to expand till ultimately we knew we had to take it global because our customers were global. And uh, it was in 1989 that we established our first facility over in the United Kingdom. And then it was uh, about nine years later when we established a facility over in China to serve that market and build product over there. Under Dave Rydell's leadership, Bergstrom pioneered environmentally friendly heating and air conditioning systems for large trucks. Back in 1995, we decided to investigate various ways of how we could build a heating and air conditioning system that would operate when the truck was down, when the engine wasn't running. The heating end was fairly easy because you could use a small fuel-fired heater to heat the coolant and, and get heat that way for heating, but air conditioning, was uh, that was a real challenge. And we, we looked at uh, several different ways that we could do this and finally decided that the, the best way uh, would be through electrification, uh, through batteries. Um, but then the challenge came, how do you uh, have enough battery capacity to run the unit, let's say, for eight hours and provide enough air conditioning in the cab? So that was a real challenge, and we got some patents on that as to how we, how we could regulate the system so that we wouldn't drain the batteries too fast. It saves fuel, obviously, but it's better for the environment, and it's also quieter when the uh, driver is sleeping. Um, so it has several advantages that way. At this point in time, I mean, our unit is, is available in all the Class 8 trucks produced in the United States, and uh, also some trucks that are produced over in Europe. Here, uh, most of our business with this product is directly through the OEs, whether it's Kenworth or Peterbilt or Navistar or Freightliner or Volvo, all of them uh, have our unit available, so all of these trucks. Rydell and his employees are deeply committed to activities that make Rockford a better place to live and work, including the Rydell Family Foundation. Certainly with our gifts from the foundation, but certainly with the time and efforts of our people because we have some very good and very competent people here and they seem to be very happy to give their time back to the community. Through the years I've been involved a lot of uh, on the boards of many community organizations. That's also been a rewarding experience for me. Being on the board as well as being able to support you know people that work in health care or education or arts or helping people in crisis. That's always been a uh, a special place for our uh, foundation to support. The honor you have given me, and which I will cherish this at all the days of my life, also belongs to those who have helped me. Certainly my parents who taught me what was important in life and brought me to church every Sunday to hear the scriptures to reinforce that. That was a big part of my upbringing. My wife, Jean, who is sitting out here, who has been my partner for over 40 years, family, incredible friends. But it also belongs to the men and women of our armed forces who have sacrificed so much, 
who daily protect our freedom to make sure that nobody will take it away. And they, too, are part of this honor. And to be very honest, I would not be here if it wasn't for them. I don't know that any of us would be here if we weren't free. My father said so many times, I'm a very fortunate man, and the same for me. And I'll close, there was a gentleman who was a big inspiration to me. He's no longer with us, but he said, Dave, if you ever get recognized for service, you better go out and do more service. So it's kind of got me worried because this is as big of a recognition as you can get. Enjoy the rest of your evening. God bless. Ladies and gentlemen, it's now a pleasure and a privilege to introduce the president of the Lincoln Academy of Illinois, the Honorable Bruce Rauner, 42nd governor of Illinois. You know, I was born on the north side of Chicago near Wrigley Field and have lived here my whole life, lived in and around the Chicago area. Um, I, I got my inspiration from my grandparents. They were dairy farmers, they had dairy cows and corn. They spoke more Swedish than they spoke English. They lived in a trailer. My grandfather taught me my three drive. Hard work, good education, and giving back in the community. We all have a moral duty to help each other. And the good Lord did not make us Democrats or Republicans. The good Lord put us on earth to do his work, help each other, make our world a better place. My inspiration, these people, you heard it. The same drive, the same commitment. Rockford's one of my favorite towns. I'm here a lot. I don't know a community anywhere in the state of Illinois or the United States of America that has more civic engagement and community love than the city of Rockford. This is an incredible community. I want to say thank you. God bless you. God bless our laureates. But most importantly, God bless the people of Illinois. Thank you very much for coming out tonight, everybody. Appreciate it.